This is the second part on Toronto's heavy rail network, operated by Go Transit. In the first part, I discussed why and how the potential of this network is wasted. I recommend watching part 1 first. Otherwise, here's a quick summary. The heavy rail network is almost twice as long, but has much lower ridership than the TTC network. The ridership is especially lacking for anyone not going to or from downtown. The GO lines have less frequent service, higher fares, fewer stations, trains that are not designed for short distance travel, and lower capacity. They are not as well connected to TTC buses and streetcars as the subway stations usually are. So, in summary, that's why the GO Transit ridership in Toronto is not as high as it should be. Now let's talk about the solutions to these problems in depth. I mentioned in the previous part that GO Transit has the option of purchasing electric multiple units meant for local service with more standing room and less seating room as they electrify the core parts of the network. But before I dive into that, let's start with the existing fleet. As of 2024, GO Transit has 91 diesel locomotives, mostly motive power locomotives built in the last 5 to 20 years, and 979 bi level coaches with build dates ranging from 1976 to 2021. To give you an idea of how big of a number that is, that's a total capacity of about 150,000 people seated. An entire city's worth of people could live in all of the GO coaches at once. GO Transit already has enough trains to run 15-minute service during rush hour on almost every single line at once. At the moment, many of the trains are left in various rail yards across the network outside of rush hour. So even though faster accelerating electric multiple units should theoretically take over the services after electrification is complete, they would very well be off just replacing the locomotives with electric locomotives as replacing the entire existing fleet with EMUs would be prohibitively expensive. However, there are a few situations where they should still purchase electric multiple units. First of all, if or when the network will reach the rolling stock capacity and require additional coaches, the choice of EMUs should be made when the opportunity arises. These EMUs can then be designed for local services with more standing room and less seating room and be allocated to local services with more frequent stops. Also, if GO Transit expands its long distance network or shares its rolling stock with other agencies to service places like London, Ontario, which it should, as they dare to call themselves regional rail, the EMU should be purchased to free up the existing rolling stock that is most appropriate for use on these longer distance services. Lastly, the oldest cars are starting to reach end of life in the coming years. These older cars should ideally be replaced with EMUs when given the opportunity. In any of these scenarios, Toronto would always benefit first because they're the ones who will certainly get the improved services with these EMUs. Another important consideration is how to deal with the services that are electric for the core part but diesel for the rest, such as services going all the way to Hamilton or Niagara Falls on Lakeshore West where electrification ends at Burlington. The locomotives for these services still need to be diesel. However, using the diesel locomotive for the entire length of the route is wasteful. The good news is that dual-mode locomotives that can switch between diesel and electric are available, and as a matter of fact, Montreal's commuter rail agency, EXO, recently transitioned their only electrified heavy rail commuter line and tunnel to a rapid transit service. So they currently have spare dual-mode locomotives that are pointlessly being run on the remaining diesel lines. GO Transit should seriously consider buying or swapping some of their diesel locomotives with the dual mode locomotives of EXO, although EXO might want to keep their dual mode locomotives for their electrification in the future. There is certainly a lack of integration between transit agencies in the city of Toronto, especially for fares. Anyone who needs to take transit on multiple agencies has to pay separate fares, and these extra fares are not always logical. 
Sure, the more you travel, the more you should pay, but there are plenty of examples where you have to pay extra just because you crossed the line. If you're heading from York Region to York University, for example, you have to pay a York Region transit fare and then a TTC fare just to take the subway for two to three stops. On the other hand, someone going from downtown Toronto to York University only has to pay the single TTC fare. I went over fare-related issues in a previous series. And the new one fare program covering the cost of these fares is only a band-aid solution, with the actual solution being to integrate the fares into a true one fare. But how? I previously brought up in the last part, integrating the GO services within the Toronto boundaries into the TTC so that at the end of the day, riders are only dealing with one transit agency and logically only one fare. One fare that could get you anywhere within Toronto. For example, one of the ways this integration could be accomplished is to transfer the GO services within Toronto to a regional rail division of the TTC. It's that easy, right? Well, if anything, the TTC has become less involved even in the expansion of its own subway system. Newer projects like Line 5 are almost always being managed by the province now because TTC does not have the budget nor the resources to take them on. And the few network expansions that are being managed by the TTC have not been going as well. The Waterfront East LRT extension is a good example of this. It is much less complex than the Ontario line, yet it'll probably take longer for this LRT line to be completed. So TTC can't afford and would not be able to manage even a part of the GO Transit network. So that leads us to the next option. The opposite could also be done. The ownership and operations of all TTC services could be transferred to Metrolinx and the province. However, this is also problematic because TTC, to their credit, has a higher fare box recovery ratio than GO Transit. That means they are more profitable than GO, so if TTC is absorbed into Metrolinx, riders in Toronto would effectively start subsidizing transit outside of Toronto. This is a not-so-favorable trade-off for Torontonians who already see their hard-earned money go to a transit agency that's very far from perfect. Lastly, they could raise the fares or somehow get more funding from the already short on cash City of Toronto, but that would be too controversial. So, what is a more realistic way of integrating the systems is to just brand the GO services within Toronto as part of the TTC network and have some sort of agreement about billing GO trips taken on a TTC fare. At the same time, the GO network's ownership and operations would remain entirely within Metrolinx. That being said, as the province takes on more of Toronto's transit infrastructure projects, the province now has more leverage to integrate the two networks together, especially as integrated regional rail is the world standard. It's also just easier to have one map and one website for all transit in Toronto, regardless of who is operating it. Montreal, also having different transit agencies, has pulled off complete fare integration, so Toronto could too. It's just a matter of deciding who is paying for it and who is benefiting from it. Generally, people, whether that be riders or levels of government, are willing to pay more only if they know they'll benefit more too. But despite all these challenges, there are still plenty of advantages of having one agency control the TTC and GO network together. One agency could more easily shift resources from one division to another depending on how the demand changes over time. It would also prevent battles over who can get the best employees or the most employees as stealing employees from each other is counterproductive for both agencies. In the case of unscheduled service disruptions, it would also allow for better contingency or backup lines that don't involve replacement buses as often. And it would allow for more or longer scheduled maintenance, which in the long run is faster than spreading out the maintenance because the alternative lines are now available at no extra charge or extra hassle at all. For example, line 2 could be closed for extended periods of time and be upgraded much faster than if the maintenance was spread out. If the Milton line had extra stations along the way that could act as substitutes for line 2 instead of the slow replacement buses.
Now that I've gone over integration issues, let's talk about the services themselves. Frequencies on all of the lines need to be increased. The more frequent the service, the more attractive the service becomes to riders. However, higher frequency service costs more to operate and requires more capacity on the lines costing more to build, thus requiring a fine balance. Right now, most would agree that Go Transit is too infrequent to serve as a viable travel option for shorter trips. No one would want to wait 15 minutes just to travel between stations 10 minutes apart, especially if they could take a bus that comes every few minutes or just walk or bike there. Thankfully, frequency increases on most Go Transit lines are already planned as part of the Go expansion, with the target being 15 minutes or better. To allow this to happen, the signaling system will be upgraded to European Train Control System, or ETCS, level 2. So, what is ETCS? ETCS is a modern signaling standard developed in Europe, as the name suggests, to replace the different signaling safety systems in Europe. Without ETCS, international trains in Europe need to have separate signaling systems for each and every country they pass. Canada doesn't have that problem because we don't have a safety system in the first place. Lucky for us. Never mind. But it does mean that we get to start from scratch. In a nutshell, ETCS takes traditional physical wayside signals and puts them in the cab in front of the driver. The physical fixed blocks are also eliminated. This allows for higher speeds and higher capacity. Higher capacity means higher reliability and frequency. So, which of the lines are getting better frequencies? Within the City of Toronto limits, the Lakeshore West, Lakeshore East, and Kitchener lines are already capable of 15-minute or better frequencies. And the Barry and Stofa lines are being double-tracked right now. So, in total, five of the seven GO lines and the areas they go through have great potential for ridership increases. The Union Pearson Express running between Pearson Airport and Union Station is also already capable of 15-minute service. I did go over this line in particular in a previous video. In addition to good frequency, the stations are also important. I briefly mentioned previously that there aren't enough GO stations in Toronto. However, new stations need to be justified. Questions like what transit connections would be available, what the existing and future densities look like, and the total costs need to be answered. Sometimes it's easier or cheaper to improve nearby bus or streetcar routes to and from the existing GO stations, especially if the density in the area is not that high. Also, the more stations you add to the network, the longer the travel time is for others taking that train. That is, unless there are also express services or skip-stop services that skip the stop in question. Currently, only the Kitchener line and both Lakeshore lines can handle express trains as they have at least three or four tracks. I'll go over the upgrades to the existing stations and the new potential stations for each line in the next part. If you enjoyed this video and want more content like this, Please consider leaving a like and subscribing to this channel. Thanks for watching.